Hello, and welcome to Galley Stories, stories of the Bering Sea and beyond, hosted by Mark Kaler. My name is Penka Jane, podcast deckhand and longtime listener. We'd thank you to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review. Here's today's catch. Off for one minute. Okay. <clears throat> Got a little raspy this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a little bit too much last night. <laughs> Well, guys, that was the mic check, but I, I had to keep it because uh, Snook's so unique and that was a good intro. Um, welcome back to another installment of Galley Stories, guys. Um, today we have an extreme veteran of the Bristol Bay fishery, and not only Bristol Bay, but all over it. She'll expi- explain that to us. We have Captain Snooks Moore. How are you, Snooks? Um, say that again. How are you today? I am great. Beautiful day out here. So where were you born and what got, you know, what was your first introduction into commercial fishing? I was born in Anchorage uh, in 1944 and my first induction was uh, probably a tender coming to Anchorage that picked up my folks and everything that they did to take us to uh, the Sentinet site just uh, south of the Kenai River. Okay. And I was three months old. Oh, okay. What was your first memory though of fishing? Uh, first memories, uh, the, we had three sites at that time on the, the beach there. Is probably chasing seagulls off the nets, and I probably was probably three or four years old. So mm-hmm. I, that was my job to go down and swish them away when they, when they first started to go dry. So. so it's been a family heritage? Yes, yes. That's, the sites originally were, my folks took them over in 1939, and they, my, my uncle had developed them, and then he... Uh, went to Clam Gulch and built a hand-driven trap, and my folks took the sites over. So, yes, long mm-hmm. time. How did it progress? Uh, they had more sites. They bought out some others and stuff. Uh, and um, uh, during the 60s, I always was picking fish in 50s. Uh, I didn't get paid when I was a kid. I just got to work on the sites. And then in the early 60s, um, my husband and I ran the sites for several years. Can you give us some of those experiences? I mean... Uh, well, we, you, you did it with family. It was all in a family operation at that time. I'll, I think we had one hired hand when we did it. Um, my folks never had anybody but uh, us and my mother and stuff. Uh, you know, we went from uh, rolling uh, skiffs up on uh, uh, basically round logs uh, First, I guess, by hand, and then uh, we had an Alice Chamler tractor. was our, our first uh, piece of uh, motorized equipment. Um, it was uh, not far from the Libby, McNeil and Libby Cannery, so I grew up around the Libby Cannery and the Kenai River from the time I was little all the way through to when I started running a boat and beyond. So those pile drivers and cooks and web people, I knew all my life. It was really an interesting way to do it have a life and mm-hmm. I spent all but one summer of my teen and young years on the beach. Excellent so. and then you, you began making your family there too? Yes um, um, most of my children were born in Alaska and I lived right there on Kalifonsky after the oil companies came through and cut a road through and we could get to the beach sites besides coming down the beach and I we had a home there and uh, lived there till 1972. My children were when it started school and stuff there. And, and, and that is where I started running a boat, too. Is, is it? Yeah, yeah. So. How did you progress from a set net site to a boat? Um, my husband had built a new Saner uh, in 1970, and the boat was there. And I'd never ran a boat. I'd been on the boat fishing with him and, um, and my dad in earlier years, too. But uh, um, I just said, hey. I think I'll take the boat for uh, fishing and this year. And, uh, of course, we had a market with then. It was Ward Cove uh, had bought Libby McNeil and Libby out in 1959 just after statehood. And they outlawed traps, and Libby said, we're out of here. And and so it was Ward Cove and the Brendels. And uh, uh, it was a uh, uh, pretty wide little uh, plywood, marine plywood uh, boat and with diesel engine. And... Uh, I think my first trip with it was from uh, Homer to Glacier Spent, towing a skiff, and I managed to put the line in the wheel for the skiff. So I knew nothing other than, you know, I could run the, do some navigation and simple boat. You know, you got one fathometer, one pump, uh, a no GPS. It was all compass course and stuff. And my next trip out was uh, 
running from there all the way to Kenai from Homer. And uh, I did learn that bucking the tide in Cook Inlet was not a good idea. It took a long time. I didn't do that again like that. And my first landing at the dock was not exactly pretty. Okay, in the harbor in Homer, it was easy, and it wasn't very pretty in the Kenai River. And of course, everybody knew me, and I kind of banged around a little bit getting in. And so everything I learned was by trial and error. But what I found out is the guys that were fishing are starting to fish, and there was people that uh, are, Paul Seaton is one that was up there, uh, John Kinsey, uh, people that are around in the fishing industry still now, and a lot of them are now in Homer, which is amazing. But uh, uh, they didn't know anything any more than I did. You know, they really didn't. What I th knew how to do was pick fish because I had been doing it all my life. And but it was it was an inter interesting experience the first little bit and 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 for quite a while. Who did you take with you on when you first decided? Hey, I'm taking the boat fishing. Um, I had a, a kid out of a Homer uh, then, but in uh, I see I'm trying to think what year. Oh, I think it was. Uh, about three years later, my daughter was 13, and I was going to hire, told her I was going to hire somebody out of her class, and she kind of said, I can do what they can do, and she fished with me, uh, Dorothy did, from the time she was 13 till she was 19. Uh, in Cook Inlet, she was my only deckhand, and I, we only had one deckhand, and uh, um, she worked very hard, and we did very well. I mean, for some reason, I had an ability to find fish, but we had a really good fishing group. So, you know, we were kind of a little ahead of the game with extra radio then, by then, and a group of guys that were pretty dang good in Cook Inlet. So, mm -hmm. so. yeah, the Cook Inlet fisheries changed, you know, obviously a lot since since those times, hasn't it? Uh, you know, it's changed in a lot of ways, but. You know, we we were moving along pretty fast to change it too. Uh, you know, I, it was a lot easier to fish, I think, than it is now because we had the whole inlet to fish. We fished. I mean, I fished. I I caught an oil ring one one day fishing up there, square on, in um, probably 1973, and uh, didn't look like I was going to get it, but I got it with both legs and. I had a new boat then, the Tom and L. The first boat was the Berlin Tom and L, a fiberglass, and uh, it was just flooding like crazy and trying to pick it up, and the dog broke, and it was obvious we weren't going to do that till the tide changed. Mm -hmm. And so the boat was also, also rigged for seining, so we just waited till the tide was changed, went back and picked it up, and with the the rigging and dumped it in the hole, and it had quite a few fish in it, but. Now, there was things like that. Cook Inland has a fast tide mm -hmm. and rips and stuff. But now they're very restricted to where they can fish and stuff. Well, we didn't have that when I started. So, mm -hmm. and, and and then I, I ended up remarrying and moving to Homer in 1972 uh, to a very nice man, Kenneth Moore. And uh, uh, we've been married for over 40 years now. And... Um, and I built a house down there, and I continued to fish the Tom and L till 19. This kind of just a quick roll of it to it till 1979, and actually I did fish Cook Inlet that year, but I also fished False Pass. It was beginning a limit entry, and um, a friend called uh, John Gardner and. We had a boat yard, but I wasn't doing brokerage or anything. And he said, said, Snooks, do you think I can sell my boat? And I said, sure, John, I think it'll sell around here. He had a really nice Roberts. And I said, well, what are you going to do with that false pass permit? And he said, I get the boat sold. I'll uh, sell the permit. So I got off the phone and got to think about it and called my husband. I said, you know, Ken, I'm going to see what John wants for the false pass permit and that, because I really wanted to um, go earlier, but I had, the kids were too small. I had, you know, a younger daughter and, and a son. And so uh, I called John back and said, how much do you want for the permit and boat? And he uh, told me that, uh, what the price was and uh, what the boat price was. And I called him back a few hours later and said, I'll send you a check and bought the boat. Well, it was spring. It was uh, already April, and um, 
my husband had a good sane season coming up, and and I was going to fish Cook Inlet. And also at that time, limited entry hadn't quite figured out all their rules, and they had a rule that if you had a permit in one area, that you could not fish anywhere else. Or, or if you fished anywhere, you couldn't fish anywhere else. They they changed that you know, almost immediately. So we just gave all the kids all the permits that year, and we didn't have any permits. <laughs> <laughs> so so we had two daughters with two Cook Inlet Drift permits, and uh, our son had the um, same permit for Cook Inlet, and, and uh, our 11-year-old daughter had the false pass permit. And we went out, Ken and I did, just for the the beginning, the uh, the Unimax side, and because we weren't prepared to go anywhere, nor did we have a market for the other side. So I came back and unfortunately sat on the beach because the Cook Inlet fish did not come in till late and not a lot, and he had a great scene. And, and then the following year, we picked up another False Pass trip permit and uh, went to False Pass. But it was a little surprising when I got out there. First of all, in Cook Inlet, when I was fishing, there was only a couple gals fishing. And uh, when I found False Pass, they were like, where'd she come from? You know, this is this is a different. I had great equipment. I had a, a 42-foot boat that would do 20 knots. It was a first-class boat. It was built for herring at Togiak fast. And um, we had a couple of them. And uh, first year, I did over 200,000 pounds out there. I mean, it was quite a change from Cook Inlet because you never did that kind of poundage. Mm -hmm. But you also didn't fish three months. So I stayed in False Pass till 1984. And the reason I was actually sold out, this is the first time I tried to quit and it didn't work. I sold the false pass permit and I wasn't going to go because we had built a boat yard and took it needed to have a lot more TLC on it. And I uh, sold it in uh, the, the winter. And at that time, I had a boat brokerage for permits and, um, and boats too, and I was doing that. And come spring, I was walking through the boat yard and Daddy Verhusen, a really good friend of mine, said, Snox, if you can get a per boat permit, you can come and fish Bristol Bay. Because I also did not want to fish three months out there in the gray. I, it's gray out there, the sun comes in and then you get fog. And so, so I just said, uh, okay, well, I'll see what I can do. And I made an offer on a permit boat or a permit over here, came over and looked at, Ken flew in from Togiak. We looked at it. I think the name of the boat was the early times. It was a Marco, and uh, it was. Then we're talking late May, and I he didn't take my offer. And I found out when I was flying home, and I was flying on the plane with a neighbor, uh, Bruce, uh, uh, from our area. He was a, a um, farmer and a fisherman, and uh, Bruce said, "Snucks." Do you think that you can sell my boat? I really, it, my back's been bothering me doing it, and also just the, the farming and everything, and um, I just don't think I can do both anymore. And I said, no, it's the first of June. I don't think so. So I got home and started thinking about it. I called back and I said, Bruce, what do you want for that boat and permit? I had no idea what the boat was. Now, I came from a 42-footer that was first class all the way through, mm -hmm. okay? And he said 125. So, That's the boat and the permit? Boat and permit. Well, it wasn't much of a boat. Um, well, at the time, it probably was a, It was fiberglass. It was a fiber form, which is a, kind of the rosin is taken off of it. I bought that boat sight on scene. Uh, and I said, well, what about your gear? Oh, I got lots of gear. Well, I also was used to pretty good gear, so I ordered... Um, gear, and uh, I ordered two sets of gear, from, and I was fishing for Icicle, and uh, had them bring it up, and I flew into Iggy Gig with an all-girl crew, okay? Now, that was a little shock to them, and that was Iggy Gig on the Iggy Gig side, and went up to the locker, and every other cork was a wood cork, and so I'm glad I had ordered gear. Kind of looked at his locker, figured out what I wanted, and went down and looked the boat, 
virtually almost put it in the water within a day and said, okay, guys, how do I get out of here? And they said, well, you head for across there and down the river. And I don't even think I had a chart with me. And I just basically compassed it up to Dillingham with this little boat. And I'm looking down at the sides of the boat and how close the water is and all things. I'm thinking, I've got to have a little more boat around me. <laughs> so I went into Dillingham and got the welder to put 18 inches of aluminum around it. I think some of the first that people did that. And Harris Electric to rewire it because it had wires going every which way for about $1,500. Of course, the cabin's only about six feet long. And uh, then I had the reel, and a lot of people have been on use reels. In fact, most of them have been on, but I came from Cook Inlet where you use a reel and False Pass where you use the reel. And, I was like, that, that's not what I'm going to do. And I mounted that reel right over the fish box. Never had round hauled a net at that time or anything. And uh, got it all ready and headed back to Iggy because that's where the group that I was going to fish with was going to be. And and uh, we were fishing on the north side, and I asked Dan, I said, well, why aren't we going? Oh, the fish come in this way. And I said, I don't think so, Dan. I think that there's got to be fish coming across that south line on the flood. So we went down there, and, and sure enough, we did. Well, well, within a few days, I put 21,000 pounds on that little boat. And when the buoys were floating, even with the top of the aluminum, and uh, we snuck in the river and got delivered, you couldn't start the have the stove on when you started the engine because it just run you out. And the cap rail had enough cracks in it that it leaked down into the bunks, but the bunks would hold water. Uh, and so I, and I had to have all girl crew too, and uh, my daughter and uh, another gal, and two others I think we had. I'm not, I slept on the floor up above, so I was the lucky one because <laughs> they had to climb into the bunks with garbage bags on because otherwise their butts would get wet. And so we we survived on very little food that you could cook that summer. It was a pretty interesting <laughs> experience. I fished that for two years. Before you move too far along, okay. what was the reaction in Igigik when it, when this all-girl crew showed up? Uh, they were pretty surprised, you know, they really were. Uh -huh. And even when I went to False Pass, because they, they never had a woman out there fishing a boat whatsoever, and the same thing. And how about the roller? Did anybody else have the have the roller on the uh, the some the net you know, yeah, yeah the, the the reels yeah there was a, there was a few but it was very few they a lot of them are just hand pulling and uh, you know if you got a good hydraulics you you can pull pretty fast with a reel and pick pick pretty fast was that a pretty good year for you that first year yeah though? it really was I, yeah it was really good you know I can look back in my records and tell you because I keep them you keep them all I yeah. keep them all. And uh, did you fix the bunk so the girls didn't get wet anymore? Yeah, I fixed it by my husband flew over the second year and we ran it up the lake and across, up the river and across the lake and into Cook Inlet and uh, fixed the boat. And Danny Verhusen basically said, You got to give it a better boat or I'm not fishing for you because I am tired of worrying about your ass. And I said, Because you're going to sink that thing out from under you. And that one time when we, one of the times when we had a big set and we were on the south end, um, we put as much as we could on board and I gave a shackle away. And my daughter, my youngest daughter, was fishing with me then. And she was crying because we gave the net away. And I said, Honey, if we don't get rid of that net, we're going to sink this boat, and then we can cry a lot more. But she cried all the way to the tender <laughs> from giving that <coughs> getting net away, and uh, <clears throat> so so that was that was pretty interesting there. And uh, um, but I that winter, uh, how I got the bunks not to be the big problem was. Uh, I so we fixed the boat up enough, and we sold it to a guy that was working for us, and it went to False Pass for a set net boat, and we we built the Razor's Edge, and uh, I've had it since 1986. Uh, it was built for togiak herring and for salmon. And so, you've been fishing Bristol Bay ever since. I've been fishing Bristol Bay ever since, and my husband used the boat for herring and togiak for quite a few years, and then he quit, and then. 
I got um, I decided I wanted to, uh, we needed to go back do the herring and it changed from being the dog fight you know it was really really good and then it got to be all these boats and a 30 minute opening and uh, he didn't like that and but I talked him back into going back to Togiak and I said I'll go extra and I'll get the boat ready because he didn't like that getting the jumping on a boat that he only fished for two weeks and didn't know and I said now you go up there and just show me how how to do this and we went from one bay to another, and he said, if you sit here, you're going to snag up. You sit there, you're most likely going to get spawn outs, And you did because he had fished up there since when Icicle went up with two boats and went around. And so I think he had made every set and probably did all those things. And I thought, I don't want to learn this. So we made an agreement. For, and that's the only time we fished together, nine years. I got the boat ready with the crew, and then he'd fly into Dillingham, and we'd go fishing. So I don't think that happens very often in Alaska either. <laughs> so, But the, the boat's been a great boat. Been kind of rebuilt several times, you know, new things, because it's not a youngster. It's a been around for a long time. You've got, you've, you've got, it keeps going up, doesn't it? Yeah, I, well, yeah, I, I put the top house on quite a few years ago, and I probably would not be fishing if it wasn't for the top house. I, you know, having cold water run down your back and running into it is not a lot of fun, and I always was on the bridge, and now I can be on the bridge, and at 70 degrees, I have a heater up there. <laughs> I, I guess it's, we, all, it's always sunny in the wheelhouse. Yeah, I guess you call you call a slipper skipper because it's de, de, dang near that. Mm. Well, it sounds like you've uh, you've you've earned that seat in more than one way. Yeah, I I have. Uh -huh, yeah, I have, and uh, I've been enjoying it, and um, I still catch fish, and I haven't rammed into anybody, so I figure when I'm the first time I ram somebody, I have to quit. But uh, I now have. Well, I have a granddaughter that's been on the boat uh, since my kids are growing up and go on doing their things. Uh, she's been on the boat since she's 11. She's 28. She has missed one season. Uh, is, that, she, is that Monica? Yeah, Monica. Mm -hmm. And I have a great grandson that is in his, going and doing his third year on the boat. He started when he was 11. He's almost 14. And... Uh, He's doing a good job on the boat. So. Seems like it runs in the in the blood in your family. Right, right. And he's actually a well, we've got to say proudly a fifth generation Alaska fisherman because my grandfather was a Finn, and he fished out of San Francisco for cod off the Amchitka Peninsula, and west side of Coquitlam, and that was what they called the this area at that time mm -hmm. when you lived in. San Francisco or everything. Do you, do you remember, um, I'm sure that you do, but a time when, when you were young and your, your, your parents and your grandparents were talking about some of the unique things in the fishery or their big fish stories? Do you um, recall one that just always came up? Yeah, you know, my grandparents, my folks' uh, dad was uh, had passed away. Cause he was he was 40 years old when he married my grandmother and proceeded to have eight children in Kenai. Uh -huh. And uh, so he, he had died in 1929 working at the old Northwest Cannery in Kenai. Uh, and he wasn't very, he was in, up in age by then. And so I never knew him. So it was more my uncles, my dad's brothers and them. And like uh, fishing, you know, in Cook Inlet, we had engines. <laughs> so, and my dad drifted and uh, he was, he actually fished with um, Libby McNeil and Libby and he started in Southeast Alaska and fished there and then fished uh, uh, Prince William Sound and then Cook Inlet with that boat and then reversed it in the fall. And, uh, and of course, they did away with that later with uh, licensing and entry doing that. But it actually made a gill netter, a professional gill netter, because he put in quite a few months mm -hmm. and stuff. And that was, a, and, but the boats were simple. I mean, you, like I said, you, you had maybe a radio. And when my dad started, I'm not sure they had radios, and and uh, they had a, a, probably a hand pump on those boats. Uh, mm -hmm. They were wood, and uh, similar to the ones that were up here, but they just uh, weren't double enders, and they didn't have they didn't have sails on them. And mm -hmm. and I had an uncle that fished up here in the 20s, 
um, with the sailboats. And another one that happened when my dad was young and, um, and um, there, he is part native and Russian and they came over the port each to go fishing over here and they couldn't get boats. Um, I mean, so, uh, they were the Italians and stuff had the boats and so he worked for uh, um, a woman, a lady that had set net sites here at the mouth of the Naknik River because that's what the set nets were, were widows and native uh, women and primarily an older folk and uh, and that's what he did and then he w went out and went to, to to more school and stuff and then worked on started on the beach and then and working for other people and then so, so that's when he got to set net sites up right. in Kenai and yeah. came along mm -hmm. Do you yeah. um obviously with this many you and you've never taken a year off uh well yes i did uh, I, I tried quitting again, and in 1991, uh, or actually it would have been 1990, I believe it was, I uh, sold my permit, and I wasn't going to go fishing anymore. So in 1991, I believe it's the year of the strike, whatever the year of the big strike was, uh, instead of getting on a plane coming to Bristol Bay, my husband and I got on a plane, because he had... He had our son had taken over his SANE permit, and uh, and we went to uh, Kansas and picked up a little car that he had built, a little uh, 1937 Jaguar piece of plastic, and we spent uh, the next six weeks uh, traveling. That was all. then, so I did take that off, and then um, I ended up the next spring, I uh, next uh, winter buying a permit. I still had the boat. I mean, son-in-law had fished the boat that year, but I was not here the year of the strike, and I probably would have went home during it because they 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 are very hard on everybody. Your best friends, and you could be on the same idea, but you can have hard feelings from those. What, what was the strike over? Price. Price. And it wasn't just here. It was the same fishery. It was throughout the state. State the prices were really low. And uh, it was it was a real tough situation. Uh -huh. Did did uh, people still fish? There was people that did fish. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were people that were fishing for markets that were better price than uh, they were asking. And I had been through the uh, uh, strike in False Pass, and the market we had was for more higher price than they were asking for. But they didn't want anybody fishing during that. And that, that time, that was interesting. I was fishing in, off Unimac, and I, we all noticed the big crab lights from the same fleet coming across. And I knew some of them. And, and you wouldn't believe it, but we did have a shotgun sitting on the deck and a Mini-14. And they, they were coming for blood, and they wanted us to dump our fish. And uh, one of the guys I knew came up and said, Snooks, you need to dump your fish. And I said, no. And my deckhand said, well, I'll just take the pile of the house windows out. And I, said, I told him, I said, you're probably messing with some, the wrong person here because if there's any problems, I will be on the phone, and there will be people troopers in here. And there were a couple guys that did dump their fish. We didn't fish the next day, but uh, and it got kind of settled, the price there. But there were a few that... A uh, guy had his kids on there, and they surrounded him, and he he threw his fish over, and and uh, you know they, they they don't make for friends, and they make hard feelings, you know. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, I, I'm sure you've got a couple instances where you've been out, and uh, and things have been scary. <laughs> Oh yeah, I have, and you know, I've I've got a pretty nice boat, but every boat has its limit. Um, I probably ran from Igigik to Nushigak a few years back. Uh, this one when we didn't have to drop our cards, and so I went over to Igigik and I got a line in my wheel, and and uh, a friend called me and said, "Snooks, the pilot has flown, and he has never seen so many fish in the bay," and uh, so. And I, Tim would have opened it over there, but the way the rules were, he couldn't open it. He had to give notice for so many hours. And I ran with a 45 on my stern that night. 
that uh, I probably wouldn't do again. It's it's one thing the boat takes me down. It's another thing that takes my young crew down. And my grandson is also fishing, and he's got a real small boat, and he took off ahead of me, and uh, he got over there. And that I ran up because I had some gear on, so I, I mean, that was probably one couple shackles, and in hindsight, I would have just left him on the boat. And I ran uh, up to uh, Coffee Point, and the Ecock Rip was just standing on end. And we got rid of the gear and went to take off, and we took a window out. And uh, my grandson-in-law was on the boat, and he said, well, we are going to town. And I said, no, we're not going to town. And uh, I called the Ecock Henry there, and um, they didn't have any plywood or anything, and one of the tenders had a piece of Lexan, and he got there, and we just smeared the the glass up and knit, screwed it down, and it stayed all summer, and we had 18,000 pounds that day. But I didn't let Newt loosen the net. It was blowing so hard. I knew that it, I needed to not be stupid and get it in the wheel. Mm -hmm. And the next day we'd had a really big day, too, because there was hardly anybody there. Yeah. I mean, two things. They weren't there, but also the weather was just plain fierce. And it was this way, that way last year. It was... Uh, a nasty, nasty wind year last year. And there was a lot of fish last year. There was quite a few fish, and there was a lot of boats. Yeah. It was quite a sight to see last year's when they said there they said there would be 600 boats, and I was like, oh, okay, well, that's going to be a little crowded. And then they said there was 900 boats, and it was like, whoa. But they, a lot of, a lot of them were uh, uh, fishing right down on the line, and at night, you would just see this solid bunch of line, bunch of boats from one end of one side of the Nushigak to the other side. I mean, it was just this big stream of, and it was never really crowded. For I was amazed because there was fish coming from one side to the other. Just everywhere. It was everywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They were, you know, they were working their way up and the, through the boats and stuff, and. I never felt like the uh, opening set was a jam or anything. I, it was it was pretty amazing, but because it was, was it was it one of your best years last year? I had a, another year that I went over three hundred, and mm -hmm. I went over three hundred last year, and and I had another one oh about ten years ago, and I have had some that bumped right up into that too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, your reputation has always been a pretty successful fisherman. Yeah, you know, I I worked very hard at it. You know, like this morning I was up at five o'clock. I didn't see a lot of people around there up at five o'clock, and, mm -hmm. and that's I don't sleep much. I I don't leave the wheel much. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, um, I enjoy that type of challenge. And, and uh, how how many generations are working on your boat right now? Um, I mean, here in Shipyard, because I saw some pretty young young guys over there working on there. Yeah, uh, mine. Well, Braden is. Uh, um, 13, okay, and uh, he's my great grandson, and then Monica is my granddaughter, um, and then I've got a couple new hands. Um, they're full time type fishermen, they're, they've been on lot, lots of boats. Uh, and a guy, guy that fished with me for 10 years has had, had a medical this year, so he's not there. And, uh, and that was a little different because I, I didn't even get in the engine room the last couple of years. And, you know, new guys, you got to show them where things are and stuff. Mm -hmm. Found out I could still climb in there. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> is, yeah. there a, is there any funny stories you'd like to share with us? I'm sure you've got some of those. Stories. Oh, I, I probably do. I mean, uh, we've, we've had some interesting experiences. with My kids fished, you know, when I went to False Pass, I took two of the kids fishing with me. And my crew that year, on that second year of False Pass, was a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old, which I doubt very many people do. And I, what I, how I'd fish that is I'd let them sleep in the morning and I'd set the net. And uh, the fun, I, it's not a, it's kind of a funny story, but it's more of a how it happened. And um, they were asleep and. Uh, the guys uh, that we were working with were kind of, I felt like I was just following and not doing my own thing. And I told them, I said, I'm going off by myself and went out quite deeper. And in the Unimac area, if you see a uh, feather, that's a rip, okay, because there's really not 
very much of a rip, the entire curtain. And I laid the net out, and you clear, beautiful day, and you run the net, and you count. You're fishing 90 mesh deep nets or long deeper, and uh, count the fish and the, multiply it by three, and that's probably what you got. And I ran it, and my husband said, he was fishing inside, and he said, yeah, we're doing pretty good in here. And I said, yeah, but I, this don't look too bad. And when I ran it the next time, it was a school of fish. They didn't even move for the boat. They didn't move at all. And of course, I just went into giggly laughing and stuff, and my husband said, you know, you might want to get a hold of that net. And so I woke my daughter up, and I said, maybe we should put some buoys on it. There was no putting any buoys on that net. It went to the bottom, 200 and some feet deep, and took us 12 hours to pick that net slowly, and 10 billion clam feathers off of old shells, a king crab, a scallop, and a cod, <laughs> and 27,000 pounds of fish. Oh, goodness. Mm hmm And picked it with Dot and a 13-year-old, Dorothy and Andrea. That was, we picked that net. Well, How many hours? 10 hours? Uh, it took us um, about seven or eight hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you got... And we got the net back 100%. How many species did you catch? Well, we caught one king crab, one scallop, and one cod besides all our uh, and 10 billion dead clamshells. <laughs> did wound. you eat the king crab? Yeah, we ate the king crab, we ate the scallop. I don't think we ate the cod. Mm -hmm. So, And the next day, thank God it was blowing because my back was out. And I took a couple muscle relaxers, and I think I went out for quite a few hours. I couldn't even get off the boat. And uh, the kids were fine. They were perfectly fine. They're, and we were tied up with other people, and it was blowing like crazy. And uh, so I got to sleep that day. I don't think I could have hardly moved in. The next it went out the third day right to the same spot, and we got about 18,000 pounds. But it was nothing like watching a river of fish. And they probably what saved me there is they hit two shackles instead of four shackles. Because if they had hit four, I think they would, they would have just lost the net. It would have yeah. been too much to get it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of bushed in there. Was that the was that the biggest set you've ever had? Um, I had a set on the flats in, in uh, the Nushigak uh, that was uh, just in that range. And that one was, um, uh, oh, gee, many questions. It was quite a few years ago. And... Uh, they called for a midnight opening, and we just kind of waited till everybody is, had sat, and uh, I just drove the boat in till I didn't have any more water. And we were, my grandson was on the boat then, who's fishing now, Justin, and uh, um, Monica, she was uh, 13, okay? And my other grandson was on the boat. He was the uh, same age as Justin. I think they were both 18. And uh, another grandson, and that was 13, that had never been on the boat. And uh, we were sitting there, Justin and Monica and I, having a, just having a sandwich. And uh, I kind of noticed that I was, we were a little, little close to the beach. I was seeing the, the white on the beach. And I said, ah, is that too close, Justin? Let's just pick it up. So he went out and he started picking up. And he came back and he said, you need to get out here. I'm not making any progress, and it was a solid fish. And then he said, you know, I kind of heard fish hitting it. So we, I was backing up on it, and we got Aaron up, and uh, the other grandson, he was, he just, it wasn't his game, and Monica, and we picked, and we picked about 50 fathoms, but it, the wind was, kept pushing us in, in, and we kept going in, and I kept backing up, and and uh, we finally said, okay, we gotta just put it on the boat. And so we put everything we could in the stern um, and got the roller wasn't high enough and we came to the end. Well, now here's a boat with rigging enough, I was topping winch, and we would have to back up, put a strap on it, tie it off, pull it up as far as we could, and plus the tide was gonna start changing. And we just lassoed that net onto it. And at, right at the last, I chopped a piece of it with the prop 
and went around and was able to get it. And that one we came out with uh, one corner of the boat underwater and just virtually because we had so much fish right in the stern mm -hmm. and uh, and come out through the fog just just on a Doing a wheelie. Yeah, just on a slant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a friend came over with his crew and helped us pick that. As it was, it was kind of that's a good up. day when you got to ask somebody to come help you pick. Them yeah, out, right? it was, and uh, and then I had one at Yagashik, but that was two sets. That was uh, just right in that twenty-seven thousand, and that one we rolled uh, the first most of it in the stern, and uh, we I had to keep moving the boat. My son came up for a couple of weeks fishing with me that year, and uh, I had to keep running because we were taking water in the stern. So, you know, they're, they're funny now. Uh, the fun ones are when you can sneak off by yourself and make a set and nobody's around, and I like to do that periodically. Just run off. <laughs> yeah, 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 just, uh, it just turns out good. It's gonna, it's gonna be in some people's minds, so, uh, Snooks, how did you get the nickname? Because it is a nickname, right? It is a nickname. My real name's Rosaline. Uh, uh, when I was born in the Providence Hospital in 1944, there were very few babies being born uh, because um, most of the men were fishermen or worked on traps or fishing. And, but in the winter, they were working on the Alaska Highway and um, because they were trying to make that, you know, they had cut it through, but it wasn't a very good road. And so I, I was born in February, and that's when they stayed in the hospital for about a week, and the nuns in the hospital um, nicknamed me Baby Snooks, and it, and it went home and it stayed. So mm -hmm. uh -huh. that's the it seems like that's what everybody knows you by. Period. That's what everybody knows me by. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, I was recently talking to somebody in Anchorage uh, with a um, finance people, and and uh, she said that one of her people said. Rosaline, oh, you mean Snooks. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, that's what people know me by, you know. Uh, would, you, uh, would you change anything about your fishing career and the, and the life that you've lived in this industry? Um, I would have liked to have went to False Pass a little, little earlier. Uh, but, you know, that was the, just the beginning of the 200-mile limit change, too, when those fish started coming in, like when I went out there. Mm -hmm. um, um, no, I couldn't have fished in the winter and had a family. You know, I had four children and I was home. I kept the books for uh, our crabbing and uh, seining operation because Ken was fishing year-round mm -hmm. and stuff. So, um, no, I, not really. Um, one of them, I guess I wish I had got some more education and some stuff that would have helped me along the line because I've sat on a couple boards, a CFAB board for a lot of years, and I sat on a, a Homer Electric board. And there was things that I wish I had done that way, but mm -hmm. I was a young mother and didn't get the opportunity then. So mm -hmm. that would probably be my biggest change. Is this, a, is this a lifestyle and a career choice and a family choice that you'd recommend? Oh, I would, yeah. yeah. I think Monica will have her own boat here in a couple of years. The only reason she doesn't now is to, she said she'd stay with me till I quit fishing, but then now she's getting to wonder if I'm ever going to quit. Well, you've already tried to quit twice, and it I didn't tried, work. I tried to quit twice, and it did not work. So, uh, But I've had some I've had some experiences. Um, let's see, I've had both knees replaced, and after I had them replaced in January, I was here fishing. I had both rotator cups uh, done different years, and uh, the best, best uh, therapy I had with them was I went stack sane, sane. <laughs> so <laughs> I got full motion. And uh, then a couple years ago, I was backpacking and broke my pelvic bone, and I actually ended up on the boat uh, leaving the, with crutches and didn't use them all summer. And then, then it didn't quite heal rolling around all summer. So, mm -hmm. uh, but, and then last year I had an AFib operation, and I did uh, transfer my permit and ended up buying a crew license because I wasn't sure I could fish at all. And uh, I left, came to the boat when it was all ready to go fishing, and I left the boat early. So um, I guess I'm going to be here. So they, they're going to have to put up with me. <laughs> now, it seems like you're, you're, it's a family tradition for sure with, with your bloodline. It is. It really is. Uh, um, like I said, I've got had uncles that were fishing over here that were um, on the— schooners 
I mean, they, they came up on the schooners and were fishing and packing herring and stuff. And my dad was fishing from the time he was young. And he had uh, two brothers that were fishing, fished all their lives. So, yeah, they did. I, I often ask uh, uh, a lot of folks that come on the show what they would suggest for young people getting in the industry. But I think with you, it should be more specific. And what would you think... What would you suggest for young women coming into the industry? Well, I think everybody should get some experience, you know, on a boat or around some kind of in the fishing. Uh, if a boat set in any, have some aspect of it. Uh, I have seen a couple gals come in that had no experience. Uh, one gal at False Pass after I was there, her husband was a biologist, and they ended up buying a boat, and she fished it out there. And she didn't have any experience when she started, and she did a good job. I mean, she did a real good job, but um, having some experience would help, I, especially in today's boats. You know, when you only have when you only have one pump and one radio and one depth finder, there's not a lot there. My boat's pretty sophisticated. It'd take a while just for somebody to figure out. I don't care if they have experience or not. Everything on it. Keep keep it simple when you start. Is where we're really. But, you, you started with the boat out of Homer and ran it to Kenai. Yeah, at a, it was a Kenai boat. We just had it down in Homer, mm -hmm. and yeah, and, and um, it was uh, a simple boat. Mm -hmm. And you, you, the Razor's Edge, you keep her really high tech. Yeah, so I, you know, it's got a lot of equipment on it, and, mm -hmm. uh, and and that takes more dollars to keep up too. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But it helps you get more fish, right? Um, well, in, the, like, in theory. Yeah, well, well, it does. And what, with twin engines, last year uh, I had a transmission go out. I just thought it was clutch plates, and but we were catching quite a bit of fish. And I ended up uh, not going into Dillingham because I've got micro commander controls, so it's real easy to switch the props, and then the 509s will operate on either end on forward. So I could have had two forwards, or at least I thought I could. And uh, we did not quit. We just uh, operated with the M1 engine and uh, bow thruster and uh, put in the last of the season and then brought it over here to get some repair into NACME to get some repairs done and yeah. found out that I'd really blown the transmission to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, no. is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? Well, I just thank my kids and uh, for being a part of my life and fishing and... Uh, They've um, they they've fished False Pass, and then they both my two of my daughters came back and fished in here in uh, Bristol Bay with me, and I've had my son-in-law on the boat. My son fished with me only a little bit. Uh, he fished with my husband and stuff, but it, you know it was a family deal. They 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 didn't get any much summers. They they got their summers on the boat. I bet they had some incredible summers. Oh, if we were to ask them, I would bet they have some great well, memories. Well, to give you one that we could have probably made a zillion dollars off of, I think, is we were at uh, Port Moeller and we were it was closed and we were anchored offshore and we had a little we always had a Zodiac with a motor and kids and actually went went to shoot up the river there. And there was a covey back in the where where the glass balls rolled in. And then we had these new 42-footers. And they brought us garbage bank fulls of glass balls. And we put them in the stern until we had to quit them, tell them that they couldn't bring any more. But I think I think they could have filled the tender with those glass balls. Let's, well, let's explain what the glass balls are, because those were the those were the uh, previous floats, right? They were the floats for the Japanese mm -hmm. um, because they won't the glass balls won't break, and when they go down under pressure, and they won't collapse. And at that time, that was the main thing they had to do. That now they built some uh, uh, different time of foam balls that can hold up to that, but. They were all over Alaska because the Japanese were, uh, and their gill nets and everything, that's what they were using. And there there were miles of gill nets uh, piled up on beaches and stuff. And you still can find the glass balls, but they were everywhere at that time. They and were, and they're worth money. Yeah, there were some money now. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. 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 yeah, I still have gunny sacks full of them at home. <laughs> <laughs> you say, saving them for that rainy day? Yeah, well, I, I've given them back to the kids fixed mm -hmm. them up and given them back to them. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was, yeah, we had them all over there. And, of course, for years later, we would have pieces of glass that had got away from one and breaking and pulling them out. Yeah, I've heard guys say, hey, I found one, you know, and it's like a real, yeah, well, excited about just one. Yeah, we, so. we had one until we 
just told them they couldn't bring any more. <laughs> <laughs> well, Snooks, I can't thank you enough for coming by this morning and sharing your story with us. Well, thank you. Thank you. And um, it's been a good life. And I'm glad to have the kids on the boat that I have now, too. I think Monica's daughter will come up next year. She's uh, She'll be 10, and I think she'll come up for Oh, she's going to start a year ahead of everybody else because it yeah. seems like everybody else yeah. starts at 11. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. It's, that, it's that bloodline. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So she's, she's wanting to come up. She'll come up for part of the summer next year. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Snooks. Uh, well, thanks again. Well, thank you. All right, guys. This has been another installment of Galley Stories, and we will see you next time.